a very good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ivan Ash, and I'm a video algorithms architect at NG Codec. And I'll be joined later by my colleague and hardware expert, Nguyen. Together, we're talking about how we build a high quality live HD VP9 encoder. When I started working on H.264 back in the early 2000s, the video compression landscape was charged with a breath of fresh air. It was at that time that H.264 was all set to leapfrog and replace a very old MPEG-2. By the late 2000s, H.264 was fairly established. However, things were beginning to slow down a little bit. There was a lot of development going on, but they were mostly incremental. People then began questioning, do we need any more compression? Haven't we ha got it at all? Flash forward, today, we live in a world that's rapidly changing. Immersive and interactive experiences like AR, VR, eSports, they're all becoming the order of the day. And 5G is poised to be a key enabler for all these technologies. Live video compression is still the underlying thread that connects all these experiences together. I wanted to show you with a bunch of numbers. Now, this year, the highest peak traffic on the Akamai network that was recorded during the World Cup, the semifinal of the World Cup soccer event, was roughly about 23 terabits per second. Clearly, this has risen, sorry. Oops. Clearly, this has risen way over 300% in just four years. The message here is live streaming is going to be a $70.5 billion industry by 2021. That's what statistics tell us. And this by far is way more higher than even the $50 billion industry that the entire global movie industry is slated to be by roughly around the time frame. So live video is exploding. And for a vast majority of people, when it comes to live video experiences, video quality is the single most important aspect. And it, the story doesn't just end there. Every bit of exceptionally compressed video actually translates into pure dollars for the platform provider. Let's take an example of Huya. Huya is a Chinese-based esports platform, as we all know. In their earnings report, they reported bandwidth costs of about 24.3 million in Q2 of this year. Not just that, they also reported that their bandwidth costs are increasing at a staggering rate of about 78% every year. And this was primarily due to increased user, uh, increased concurrent users. So if they could find a way to shave off 30% of that bandwidth, what that would amount to is a staggering $52 million in cost savings every year. Not just that, this would go directly to their bottom line. So what this means is that video compression not just affects your top line, but also your bottom line. The question now is, the obvious question now is, how do we achieve this 30% savings in bandwidth for live encode. So again, we are coming clearly to a full circle and looking at next generation compression. So let's look at VP9. VP9, as we all know, is a royalty-free codec that was developed by Google, primarily targeted at YouTube. And back in 2015, Google reported that they were able to see about 50% bandwidth savings using VP9. Again, in 2016, Netflix, when they deployed VP9, there were reports that they were able to save about 36% in conjunction with some other technologies. Clearly, VP9 has been very established. It has a huge install base. 
So the question now is, can VP9 offer everything that is offered for the non-real-time scenario to live encoding? As engineers, we started by looking right at the coding tools. Clearly, VP9 has all the latest and greatest comparable to other technologies of the time, like HEVC. It has increased block sizes, partitions, flexible transforms, better interpolation filters, deblocking filters, and a very competent entropy encoder. While I'm not going to go into the details of each and every one of these, but what I will do is to illustrate our approach using a few examples. Let's look at block sizes and partitioning. A big part of the compression efficiency improvements that is achieved in VP9 can be attributed to large prediction block sizes. Now, larger block sizes are particularly useful for saving bits when it, in interframe on predictable content. Also, by minimizing signaling overheads, larger block sizes are very well efficient when it comes to encoding high-resolution content. Let's take another example, transforms. Now, VP9 also supports a wide array of transform sizes all the way from 32 by 32 down to 4 by 4. And large transforms, as you can see in the figure here, are better used for smoother areas like the sky, and it's able to preserve the details in those areas, whereas smaller transform sizes are better able to capture the fine details, let's say, in the buildings, in the lamp poles, et cetera, as you can see. Now, we were convinced that VP9 has the coding tools that are needed to give us the compression efficiency for live, so we put it to test. We started off with H.264, the X.264 medium at three megabits, and we wanted to compare it with a libvpx a fast, with faster settings at two megabits, roughly about 30%. Here's what we got. Is there a play button here? Sorry. Oops. Last shot. All right, that wouldn't play. Sorry. Anyway, um, we, what, what we saw, okay, it does play. All right, that's good. So this is roughly what we saw, right? There, there was, we were not impressed. For live, clearly, it was not cutting it for us. And while Netflix and YouTube have reported insane gains or compression efficiency for mostly offline encoding, what we saw with VP9 was not that very impressive for our live encoding. So we wanted to create a leapfrog product that performs exceptionally faster and delivers great compression efficiency. That is the ng-codec live encoder. Now, how did we get there? As you saw, I mean, we were pretty convinced that the VP9 has all the coding tools uh, that, that the standard offers to get us, help us get there. But the next question was, was it all enough? Obviously not because libvpx has all those coding tools in it as well. So what is missing here? As we know, every standard has a normative part, the coding tools that the standard offers. Also, the other part of the, or the missing part of this equation 
is the encoding algorithms, meaning how are these coding tools combined together to effectively get the compression rate where it needs to be. Now, as we saw clearly, VP9 has a lot more combinations. It has a lot of partition sizes, transform sizes, uh, et cetera, you name it. So the, the, what this amounts is a variety of options that the encoder can choose from. And what does that result? A lot of decisions that the encoder has to take for block partitioning, for coding modes, for prediction. So in order to be able to take full advantage of the larger combination, our VP9 encoder had to perform what we call a rate distortion optimized mode decision. It had to be exhaustively sweeping at all the prediction and transform sizes, and this includes RDO optimized mode decisions also across all the inter-candidates and the intra-prediction modes. And so the task for the encoder was really to find the best coding modes amongst all the combinations for every block in every picture so that the distortion, which is obviously compression, is a lossy process. So the distortion that results is minimal, yet we always uh, are under the rate constraint. So that's how the encoder, by using the right coding tools at the right places, still minimizes the distortion and adheres to the bit rate. And this improves the compression efficiency. So that was the first part of the equation. Next up, I'll look at another aspect, rate control. Now, fortunately for us, uh, when it came to rate control, we didn't have to invent everything from scratch. We had a fairly decent rate control in our HEVC at that time. We were able to, since rate control is agnostic, we were able to take that and plug that in right with a few minor tweaks into the VP9 encoder, but it still had to be uh, optimized. For example, one condition that I show here uh, is uh, a comparison with, it, with our encoder with X264. We did have problems like these when we started, which were optimized. So what happens here is a, is a typical scene change problem when the QPs transition uh, from very low to very high all of a sudden, and the buffer levels get very unsteady. So we solved this problem by integrating tightly the rate control with our uh, pre-analysis tool, our look ahead, which kept a buffer of the upcoming frames, and it was able to detect scene changes in advance and give feedback to the rate control, which then ensured that there was no drastic QP variations, keeping the buffer fairly flat, and what that meant was exceptional visual quality gain. And there's one more example that I wanted to illustrate here. Again, keeping our look ahead, uh, we were able to tune our adaptive quantization. Adaptive quant is mostly a subjective tool uh, that improves your visual experience. And for this, we used our look ahead, which produced uh, what we call uh, a scene content and lighting analysis with using a metric which we call an activity measure. Now, with this complexity information, and this complexity information was both spatial and temporal, and using that information, we were able to optimally allocate the bits for every block where the bits needed to go and shave it away from where you didn't need them. Uh, this process is it's slightly counterintuitive, but here's how it works. So if you have uh, a lot of, uh, in, in areas where it's, it's fairly flat and there's not a lot of detail, the human eye is fairly sensitive, meaning, like for example, in the areas around the sky, they're pretty flat, there's not a lot of detail. Any change there, the eye is able to perceive it fairly quickly. So you don't want to take off a lot of bits there. You want to add more bits, meaning you offset the quants negatively. Whereas in areas of detail, for example, in the buildings on some of the payments, uh, you see that there's a lot of detail. And I simply cannot process all that information. So you can get away by shaving off bits from there, meaning you increase the QP there. So the adaptive quant balances it out so that you, know, you get a really uh, exceptional visual experience. The way VP9 handles it, VP9 has a, a feature called segmentation, which allows you know, these quant offsets to be mapped into up to eight different segments, and that gives you a complete balanced spatial quality around the picture. 
So uh, these are some of the techniques that we employed to ensure that we were able to get the quality levels where they needed to be. Now, uh, without further ado, I wanted to hand over to my colleague Nguyen, who will talk about the intricacies of how all this complexity were handled in hardware. Over to you, Nguyen. Thank you, Abhinash. So we, talk, we need to talk about the architecture of how we are VP9 encoder. But before that, let's just talk about the encoder itself. So this is the anatomy of the hardware encoder. A good encoder should have all of these uh, features or blocks. First, we have the pre-processing unit where we extract as much information about the video stream so that we can learn about it, whether there are moving, fast moving objects in it, how detailed is the uh, video frame, or whether there will be a scene chain coming up. Knowing that feeding into our encoder would make the encoder encode more efficient with the lower bit rate and a higher visual quality. The next block is the motion estimation where we search low and high, finding the best match we can find for our video. The next block is the precision, uh, prediction and the mode selection. So we do prediction from the video around our, our block. And also select which mode to use, which partition to use, to basically get the best uh, prediction out there to use the lowest bit and get the highest visual quality. The output of that is a prediction that we send to the decoder along with the differences between that prediction and the incoming video. That differences go through transform to get it into the frequency domain where we can quantize away or reduce the precision to save our bit, but yet the, uh, losing some of the high frequency domain where it not as uh, uh, have a lower effect on the visual quality. The output of that, what we call the quantile coefficient, go through an entropy coding. This is a lossless uh, encoder. Um, <clears throat> and for VP9, we are using the content adaptive uh, binary arithmetic coding. And the output is the bit stream that we can send to the decoder. As in the decoder, all the reversing of that where we do inverse quantize, inverse transform, to reconstruct something to add it back with our prediction and form back a video frame. That video frame will go through filtering so that we can remove all the blockiness that produced by partitioning and using different quantization um, uh, parameter. The output of the filter is the video frame that the decoder or the user would see. In encoder, we use that as a reference frame to predict and to estimate our upcoming video frame. So there's a lot of computation that going on to make the encoder to encode a video frame. What are the blocks that have high uh, computational uh, logic? So we have the motion estimation where we search multiple reference, references and we also search a weighted average of some of the uh, reference as well. So there's a lot of combination in there. Also, we search a large area trying to find the best uh, match that we can find. The next block is the mode decision where we have to calculate something where Avinash called the RDO. Um, the, it is involved transform, it involved quantizing in there as well. So let's take one, um, a look at an example of uh, a transform block. I have up here the 32 by 32 DCT transform, that one of the uh, transformer we have. So we ha what it is is a two 32 by 32 matrix multiplication. As you all know, the, the number of multiplication that we need to do there is 2 by 32 by 32 by 32. That come out to be 64,000 multiplication and addition that you need to perform for one 32 by 32 DT, DCT transform. Let's say we can do some optimization and using the symmetry of the coefficient and reduce it down to just a four of the, the number of multiplication or so. It's still 16,000 multiplication that you have to do for one DCT transform. With 2,000 of those in a video frame and 60 frame, 
per second, you have to operate something in the order of two trillion multiplication per second. So there's a lot of computation in there, but that is just for the DCT alone. This is an example of what we do in one of our um, encoder, a previous generation encoder. The number of DCT quantization, the number of set calculation that we have to do, and interpolation so that we can uh, predict in subpixel accuracy. What it comes down, the number that you can see up there is about 500 trillion addition that you have to do, or 77 trillion multiplication that you have to do so that you can encode video frame 1080p uh, 60 um, at, uh, at, at live. So all of this, um, a soft, for a software to do is almost impossible or very hard to do. In fact, the Intel Core i7, true Rhinestone benchmark, can only do about 317 trillion instruction per second or so at, 300 giga, uh, at 3 gigahertz. The same thing with the uh, AMD Ryan 7, the 1800X can do about 300 trillion instruction per second or so. And that is with A core 16 threads running at 3.6 gigahertz. So software can do it. What do we do? Of course, hardware, right? This is how we do it NG codec. We choose FPGA structure to do our encoder. What we have is the host interface through PCIe where the video coming in. We have the video input uh, block that format it and pre-process it where we learn as much about the video and feed it into a microblade, which is a, C, a small CPU on the FPGA itself. That use all the information that we learn from the pre-processing unit to make a better intelligent decision about what to encode, about our video uh, structure, about what rate parameter that we can feed to the encoder. The encoder then use that to encode and output a bitstream that coming back out to the host through the PCIe interface again. Along with that, the encoder feedback statistics so that the microblade can make a smarter, better decision for the following frame. So it's fairly complex. So how complex is it? In software, you would measure it using um, how many instructions do you need to perform the encoding. For hardware, it actually is the amount of logic gate that we need to implement in the encoder how much on-chip memory, and how much of memory bandwidth do we need. In choosing FPGA, those numbers are counted in LUT, SRAM, and DSP. So this is a map of uh, our encoder, and we are using a Xilin VU9P, and that take about 50% of the resource or so. Our next generation codec that we can optimize and can do two 1080p60 in real time, or one 4kp30 in real time for VP9. So why FPGA? It's flexible, it's readily available, it's out there. A lot of uh, data center has the FPGA uh, plug-in cards in it. We can reuse it. Um, it's powerful enough and, and when you don't encode, the FPGA can reprogram for other purposes as well. So how do we do it at NT Codec? We start out with a bit accuracy model. We refine it so that we can get a good model. When we're satisfied with that, we're implementing our HLS, which is in C and C++. With verification, making sure that HLS code is matched with bit accuracy model. We then using a third-party vendor uh, tool. For us, we use Xilinx HLS, Vivado HLS to compile it or synthesize it into RTL machine. And that is implemented into FPGA. And the output of that is a FPGA image that can do VP9 for 1080p 60 video live. Thanks, Nguyen. Uh <clears throat> Let's look at uh, how far we have got. I hope the video works this time. Click one more. Oops. All right. 
So this is the same experiment. Uh, on our left is H.264, and on the right this time is RVP9 encoder. Same 3 megabits versus 2 megabits. I hope you were able to see the differences that we saw. And, and in terms of objective metrics, whether it was VMAF or PSNR or SSIM, they pretty much tell the same story. We were able to achieve the compression gains that we were after, or we were pretty close. And in, in, our uh, VP9 encoder is also very close, um, slightly below our own uh, HEVC implementation, and we are working to close that gap. Now, New one here spoke a lot about hardware, and it's all very complex. I mean, even for someone like myself, I, I don't consider myself an expert on hardware. It, it just goes over the top. So what, is that, what does that mean for a lot of us here? Uh, I'm just going to quickly wrap up. The, the FPGAs here are deployed in cloud servers. And once you install the FPGA binary with the driver that we provide, it will completely abstract you from the underlying hardware. The software stack can work as before. For example, if you're using FFmpeg to encode uh, a video using v to VP9 using a cloud server, you would be able to continue to use the same framework using the FPGA in just a changing, by just changing a switch. So it's this driver that we provide will be able to abstract the underlying hardware completely, making it a nearly seamless switch for you. And if you want more information, there are some step-by-step -step guides that we put together. Feel free to go to the website and check them out or reach, them, reach out to us after. Uh, to quickly recap, we started with, uh, we explored if VP9 was a candidate for live encode. We saw how this was possible using a combination of coding tools and the intelligent algorithms that we built. We then delved into how this was all implementable in hardware and also quickly saw how these can be accessed by software engineers like us on the cloud today. Now, I hope you're all pumped up about compression after this conversation. And if you are, I have some other good news to share. I've been working on a book on compression, primarily dealing with the fundamentals of video compression, making it sound a lot more easier and to make all the complexity uh, in, a, in a better form. Uh, I'm hoping the book will be released later this year. And do sign up on the uh, web page, and you will be able to get early access and free downloads, uh, free chapter downloads from the book. And also for all DMUX attendees, uh, for all you guys here, and also people watching it online, uh, you would be able to use this, ex use this code to get a 40% flat off the book. So feel free to reach out to me. Uh, um, and uh, let me know what you think, what you want in that book, et cetera, whatever. Uh, I'm, glad, I'm thanking uh, you all for your kind attention. And uh, thanks a lot for the uh, entire video community here and for DMUX for giving us this opportunity. Thank you.